Thank you all very much. You know, I, uh, <laughs> I um, was going to cancel on all of you, I have to admit, uh, because um, when I had accepted uh, Father Karu's invitation to come and speak to you all, I had actually planned to be here for the whole day and uh, address you and take care of some other important meetings and business. But unfortunately, I have to be in my constituency of Thiruvananthapuram tonight. And, um, and so I realized that my original slot at your program, which was four o'clock, was no longer possible. Uh, when I mentioned that to the organizers, they said, we'll change the slot for you, come and speak to us in the morning. So I've come from Delhi just for this. I've come from the airport to you. And I'm going from here to the airport. So it really is just, just for you. But seeing you all here today has shown me that the trip was very much worthwhile. Thank you for coming. I've been asked to speak to you all on my thoughts about education for New India. And I have to say that uh, one doesn't need a stint in the Ministry of Human Resource Development, as I was privileged to have um, for, a, for a year and a half, to realize that in a fractured, impatient, and yet hopeful society like our country's, education is the most significant instrument of individual self-realization and democratic empowerment. In the 21st century, we have reached a stage of historical evolution where the acquisition and wielding of knowledge, along with the instrument of its spread, which is, of course, education, trumps all other attainments, while increasingly becoming the prime determinant of the success and worth of any nation or civilization. The fact is that um, this wasn't the case for the greater part of human history. Indeed, um, martial prowess, mercantile success were often accorded greater importance at different times, but Indian society has historically emphasized the importance of education as one of the supreme objects of human existence while celebrating a strong foundation in imparting education both through traditional and non-traditional methods. Traditional methods of the Guru Shishya Parampara uh, thrived in India. We uh, know about the famous monasteries that functioned as universities in what is now modern Bengal and Bihar. Six of these monasteries, Vikramshila, Nalanda, Somapura Mahavira, Mahavihara, uh, Odantapura, Jagadala, and Takshasila were premier educational institutions in the ancient world with a coordinated network amongst themselves. And they, were, they attracted students from around the world who came to study at these institutions of higher learning. Among all these, Nalanda University in particular actually enjoyed global renown when Oxford and Cambridge were not even gleams in their founders' eyes, employing over 2,000 teachers, opening its door to 10,000 students from countries ranging from Korea, Japan, China, Tibet, and Indonesia in the East to Persia and Turkey in the West, in a remarkable campus that 1,300 years ago featured a nine-story tall library, teaching subjects, of course, that included fine arts, medicine, mathematics, astronomy, politics, and the art of war. I'm not sure they learned it very well, because as you know, they got destroyed by the invading Bhatia Hilji, but that's another story. Now, in addition to monasteries and formal establishments of learning, informal institutions and methods of education also flourished in India, such as oral education, which was sustained through the generations and has allowed our most ancient knowledge to thrive and be passed on. Mahatma Gandhi, for example, found inspiration in the ways of the knowledge of the Vedas and other foundational Hindu texts, like the Itihasas, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, who were passed orally from one generation to another, memorably advocated oral education in place of the prevailing emphasis on textbooks. He said the true textbook for the pupil is the teacher. And so in the little ashram that he created in South Africa, named Tolstoy Farm, he taught his students through his own voice, 
imparting his convictions orally and disregarding the need for formal written work. Of course, formal education has its place too. As a child at school, I remember being exhorted to impart the alphabet to our domestic staff, our servants, under the Gandhian Each One Teach One program. And many of us were brought up in Swami Vivekananda's writings about the importance of education for the poor as the key to their uplift. However, while such traditions gave Indian education its moorings in our culture, there is no escaping the stark reality that following the crippling and debilitating colonial rule, India achieved independence with only 17% literacy, barely 30 universities, and about 700 colleges, with an enrollment in 1947 of just 4 lakh students. Moreover, for the next five decades, India remained, or most of the next uh, four, four and a half decades anyway, India remained the poorest, the most illiterate, the most malnourished, and the least gender sensitive major country in the world, with over half of the world's illiterate adults and 40% of the world's out of school children residing in India. More children in our country have not seen the inside of a school than in any other country in the world. Despite these humble beginnings, we have steadily climbed the stairs of progress, starting with Nehruji's vision and efforts to systematically very, build up a very large system of education and to create a large pool of men and women equipped with robust scientific and technological capabilities, sensitive humanist and philosophical thought, and profound creativity. This revolution and revival of education in India has boosted our overall literacy to about 79%, and I'll talk about that a little later. Now we have over 20 million students start studying in more than 650 universities and over 35,000 colleges. Today, Americans speak of our IITs with the same reverence that they used to accord just to MIT. Indeed, the image of India has changed thanks to our educational system at the higher levels from that of a backward developing country to a sophisticated land that produces engineers and computer experts. In fact, this can have unintended consequences. I met an Indian friend the other day who, like me, had done his honors degree in history. And he was approached by a perspiring European at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam saying, you're Indian, you're Indian, can you help me fix my laptop? <laughs> the fact is that at one time all Indians were seen as snake charmers and, uh, and sadhus, now we're all seen as, as computer wizards and software geeks. Now this overwhelming transformation, of course, can be traced um, through, um, the story of this transformation can be traced through four E's the capital letter E. And, and for the first few decades after independence, our focus was principally on the two major E's of the Indian education system, expansion, which I've already summarized, and equity, which is to ensure the inclusion of the excluded and marginalized groups of our society, those left out of education for reasons of caste, religion, region, or gender. However, in the process of striding forward during 70 years of independence, what has made the present scenario somewhat stagnant and worrying is, in my view, our neglect of the third E, which is excellence. And I'm going to come back to that in due course. But let me start briefly more, once more with the first E, expansion. It's at the heart of our efforts to ensure that our massive demographic blessing with one of the world's largest young populations does not become a demographic disaster. Today we are an amazingly young country with half our population under 25. Uh, 225 million young people in the age group of 10 to 19, that is the children who are going through the school system, reaching the graduating level from school and poised for higher education. However, the distinctive factor about this demographic dividend is that it's happening at a time when the rest of the world is aging. I say this because by 2020, if you look around the world, the average age in Japan will be 47, in Europe it will be 46, in China, a relatively young country so far, it will be over 40. Even the United States, with youthful immigrant-fueled America, will be over 40 by 2020, whereas our average age will be 29. 
So we have a tremendous amount of potential. The fact is that we are potentially the youthful, dynamic, productive workforce for the world, uh, ready to play the role that China has been playing for the last generation. But the real question is, do we have the ability to train and educate and equip our young people for the opportunities that the world offers them and the economy of the 21st century offers them? There, I'm not so sure. And yet we know that if we fail to do this, the demographic disaster I mentioned could really happen because nothing is more dangerous for a society like ours than a legion of uneducated, unemployed, and therefore, because uneducated, unemployable, and frustrated young men, vulnerable to the blandishments of a Marxist ideologue offering a thousand rupees and a Kalashnikov. We've had Maoist incidents in 165 of our 625 districts, and those have all happened essentially because of the vulnerability of uneducated, unemployed young men, particularly in our tribal areas. So realizing the great importance of a sound quality school education, that, that that is a prerequisite to our young generation's future in this country, the UPA government, of which I was privileged to be a part, had launched a series of schemes in the school education sector to ensure that every gap was filled. And I'm, I, 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 I know I've been asked to give you a, a lengthy lecture, but I'm going to leave out certain things so we can have a meaning, meaningful question and answer interaction afterwards, which is something I would enjoy more, and perhaps some of you uh, may want to think about what, what issues you want to engage with me on. But very simply, um, you know the government of India launched the Sarva Siksha in 2001. Um, it didn't achieve all the targets it set out in that scheme. Then my government passed the Right of Children to Free and Compulsory Education Act, 2009, the RTE Act. And in the old days, after all, if a child was out of school, it was the parents' fault under the RTE. If the child is not in school, it's the state's fault. So it puts the onus on the government to get children into school. And this really did actually succeed purely at the enrollment level because um, with free and compulsory education to all children between 6 and 14, we have found ourselves in a position where not only have we been able to address the needs of all these children uh, in over 1.1 million schools across the country, but the gross enrollment ratio, you know what that is, right? It's you take the population in a particular age group and see what percentage of that population is enrolled. That's the gross enrollment ratio. In primary education at the end of the UPA stint, it was up to 104%. That is, we had enrolled more children than we thought existed at that age to enroll in primary school. And of course, part of the reason was those who had been left out of primary school in the past were now trying to catch up, and the midday meals and the greater public awareness after RT was certainly an asset. Now, our primary school system has become one of the largest in the world. There are something like 300 million children attending classes in India, private or public school, government or otherwise, um, somewhere or the other in India on a typical day there are 300 million children going to school. Now the challenge nonetheless remains to increase and expand the very few quality world-class institutions that our country has across the primary, secondary and post-secondary levels. How can we maintain the much wanted economic growth rate that we've now slipped from after the present government has, has come into office? Uh, how can we maintain or even return to the old rates if we don't produce enough educated Indians to claim the jobs that a 21st century economy offers. We rely on a handful of excellent private and missionary schools, many of which are IC, ISC and ICSC schools, to produce the educated elite of our country. And we tolerate a large number of uneven and often hopeless government schools, as well as, of course, somewhere in between, the efforts of a large number, one might even say not large enough, of charitable organizations. Indeed, um, my worry is that we seem to have a few islands of excellence in a vast sea of mediocrity. And this is also the case in our higher education. It's also a question of numbers as well as quality. When I left India, for example, for postgraduate studies in the US in 1975, 
There were perhaps 600 million people in India, and we had five IITs and two IIMs. When I came back 33 years later in 2008 to work here, we had doubled our population, but we had gone only from five IITs to seven, from two IIMs to six. So what, what is the problem at the moment in terms of our numbers? Uh, even though seven IITs, one was merely the relabeling of an existing regional engineering college. With 1.3 billion people, we've now gone up to 23 IITs. Um, but to keep up with the demand and the needs of the marketplace, shouldn't we be having even more quality institutions or similar institutes at par with the IIT to serve as models of excellence in the education sector? On the other hand, do we have adequate resources and good enough teachers to take up institutions at that level? At the same time, even in our existing education setup, we're struggling to convert our current access to education to an equitable participation at all the levels of education. So if you look at the figures of student enrollment I mentioned, great that we got 104% at the primary level, but by class eight, the enrollment drops to 69%. By class 11 and 12, it's down to 39%. So not only is the GER dropped precipitously, but that means that kids who went to school are leaving early with only a very partial education. Um, and clearly, we are not retaining uh, the majority of our primary school children through high school. So the good education that we like to talk about is still only available to the privileged few, the kind of children who are in your schools. While the increasing privatization of the education sector in India is trying to make up for this vacuum that exists, it's also brought in concerns of commercialization, unfair uh, practices, and the charge that people are purchasing merit so one can argue that this is a, a good place to segue from the issue of expansion to the one of equity. How can we have a more inclusive education system? There can be little disagreement that a broad-based, easy access education system that yet systematically neglects the needs of sections of our population is simply not correct. We may progress towards overcoming these disadvantages through our policies. But the fact is that, um, that one of the big challenges we have is indeed the way in which we have neglected the education of the girl child. I'm impressed to see that in this hall we have a majority of women, but that is not true in our classroom. In fact, uh, the saddest aspect of India's literacy statistics is the disproportionate uh, proportion of women who remain illiterate. 60% of India's illiterates are women. Female literacy at 66% is 16 percentage points lower than male literacy uh, in the last census. At the end of 2011, the male literacy levels for children aged seven years and above exceeded the female literacy level by 16.6%. And in fact, in terms of female youth literacy, that's the age group from 15 to 24, India lags behind Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, China, Thailand. The proportion of non-literate persons in the 15 to 19 age group <coughs> was almost 16% for females and 86% for males. So it's very clear that our culture is to blame. The girl, the girl child faces all sorts of pressures, particularly in poor households pressure to drop out of school to help the mother, help the household, perform sibling care duties, perform domestic chores, and even then the continuing pressure to get married early. In fact, one of the more difficult questions that I found myself being faced with when I was at the United Nations, um, especially when I've been addressing a generalist, well-meaning audience, is they would ask me, what is the single most important thing that can be done to improve the world? That's a kind of question that brings out the most bureaucratic uh, in, of, of the most, of, of the most um, directive communicators because one feels obliged to explain how complex are the challenges confronting humanity, how no one task alone can be singled out over other goals, how the struggle for peace, the fight against poverty, the battle to eradicate disease, etc., must all be weighed side by side and so mind-numbingly on. But then I... Stop saying that. I cast my caution to the winds 
and said, I will venture an answer to this most impossible of questions, that is, what is the single most important thing that can be done to improve the world? And I said, if I have to pick one thing, I would pick a two-word mantra, educate girls. And it's clear there are a lot of studies that show that the advantages of educating girls are transformative for a society. That as Mahatma Gandhi said, if you educate a boy, it's a good thing when you educate one person. If you educate a girl, you usually educate a family, influence a community, transform society. And, and this is something we really, really have to do much more conscientiously. Kofi Annan had said, my old boss at the UN, no other policy is as likely to raise economic productivity, lower infant and maternal mortality, improve nutrition, promote health, including the prevention of HIV AIDS, and increase the chances for education of the next generation as investing in women and girls. And I can tell you that all the studies that I have read from around the world is absolutely confirming that our governments whether UPA, NDA, I don't care which political coloration, could do no better than investing a lot of energy, priority, and money in uh, educating girls. Now, there's also the challenge of poverty. Uh, I know that ISC schools, almost by definition, are dealing with the more privileged sections of society. But I visited an unusual school that does, in fact, um, have students sitting for the ISC examination. If anybody is here from the Bangalore School Parikrama, please raise your hand. Anyone here? But Parikrama was a very interesting example. It offers a world-class English language education for slum children. They pick up children whose family income is below 750 rupees a month. So if the parent earns more than that, then they're not eligible. But what they do is they bring these children in and they give them a totally free education, completely subsidized by charity. They have educational standards in English at the highest levels. I mean, the comparator would be Dune School and places like that. They, on top of that, what they do is, because the children are so poor, as soon as they arrive at school, they are given food. They're given food in the middle of the day, they're given food at the end of the day. Because they can't afford to come to school, they're given a bus pass to come and go. And because they can't afford their uniforms, the uniforms are provided free. And the school goes even farther than that and says that if there are problems at home, that may oblige the parents to keep the child at home. For example, a sick mother, an alcoholic father, or a single mother who needs help from the children, whatever. Then the school will visit the home and help the parents financially and otherwise, so that the child is not prevented from coming to school. It's an extraordinarily holistic thing, and as a result, you have these children, some of whom, uh, I mean, I, I had one, one kid I was talking to at the school um, who was about to take the, the ISC examinations. Um, and when I asked them, so what do you want to do? And they all raised their hands. Uh, obviously, being Bangalore, many wanted to go into IT, but several wanted to take the civil service examinations. Uh, and, and, and one child who spoke boldly of his determined, uh, determination to join the IAS, the founder of the school whispered to me, I found him selling newspapers at a traffic light. So that is the kind of story that I think uh, gives me hope that there is no child in our country who cannot benefit from a good education. But the tragedy is, of course, that uh, while these stories are heartwarming, we also recognize that not every school can afford to spend this kind of money. The model is a wonderful model, but it's not financially easily replicable elsewhere. You're asking essentially to provide every foundation. He's also educating slum children, but in a boarding school format, unlike Parikrama. Teach for India is doing some very interesting work along these lines as well. And I'm sure there are many other charitable organizations, perhaps somebody in this room. I can only mention the ones I've personally come across. But the fact is that the most important lesson they're teaching us is that India is never going to be the great 21st century power it wants to be if it doesn't educate its young, not just those who can afford an education, but all its young. That is the real challenge of equity. And the fact is that 
We all know that because education is a state subject in our constitution, the quality varies widely from state to state, that uh, we have Kerala with a 100% record in putting children through primary school, and we have Bihar's female literacy rate, which the last time I checked was down to 27% female literacy in Bihar. Now this kind of thing is, I think, uh, and this states that we're in today, Rajasthan, is I think the second worst. So we really have to do something about issues of female literacy. Um, it was striking when I asked those children at Parikrama, what you want to do? One girl raised her hand and she said, I want to join the CBI. So I said, why the CBI? She said, I want to deliver justice to my society. And I thought, what a wonderful story. We need to bring justice to the needs of all our children uh, in, our, in our country. The other thing that, that, that I would turn to from expansion and equity is excellence. That is the one that we've neglected, as I mentioned earlier. And I would start off with the school system and the way in which we teach. Uh, for me, one of the frustrations um, about our school system has always been the relative de-emphasis in many schools of creativity and the over-emphasis on rote learning. I found, for example, that this comes from the culture of examinations. It may be a reflection of our population size. There are so many children in each classroom, uh, so many people competing for places at good universities and so on, that everybody from the teachers to the parents can only judge the effectiveness of the education and the success of the child by an examination result. And so we're constantly putting kids through the drill of preparing for exams, studying from the textbooks, learning what they are told by the teacher, and regurgitating it in the examinations to get high marks. And I have to say that this is a deeply inadequate approach in the school education system of our country. And this is not sour grapes on my part, because I was in one of those children who was inconveniently good at taking exams. I came first in everything throughout school and college in India. So I'm not uh, complaining about the way the exam system worked for me. But I do believe that the exam results are absolutely no indication of true intellectual worth. And very often, some of the brighter, more creative, more productive children are the ones uh, who didn't necessarily do very well in our exam system. Equally, you know, the big examination called life has a habit of asking questions that you couldn't prepare for out of your textbook. So um, I have argued for some time now, and some of you may have already heard, the, heard me saying this because I know a YouTube video of mine on the subject of education where I made this point has gone reasonably viral with over a million viewers. I've made the point that what we need in the 21st century is not a well-filled mind, which is what the old education system used to give us, in the era of Google, you don't need to cram your mind full of facts. You can find them with two clicks of a mouse in the real world. What we need is not a well-filled mind. We need a well-formed mind. And a well-formed mind is a mind that is capable of receiving unfamiliar facts and synthesizing them and seeing clear patterns in them, finding a way to a solution to a problem. A well-formed mind can deal with the unanticipated, the unexpected, but have a frame of reference and a context within which to deal with the unexpected information. A well-formed mind can be applied to any problem, not just, what, not just the specific problems that a well-filled mind has studied. And that, to my mind, is extremely, extremely important. There's a line that's been attributed to Einstein, that true education is what is left behind in your mind after you've forgotten everything you studied for the examinations. And I think that is absolutely true, because an educated mind is a mind that is able to deal with things way beyond the curriculum. The other problem in our culture is our great deference and respect for hierarchy, for age, for authority, uh, for teachers. But a school that says you cannot question the teacher is no school at all. It must be indispensable for a good education system that the child should feel free to question the teacher, not just because he hasn't heard something the teacher is lecturing in, not just to say why, but also to ask why not? Why must something always be the way that you are saying it has been? Uh, and, and that kind of 
thinking and challenging is what generates creativity, what allows you to think out of the box. When I address school audiences, I often tell them the story of something that I certainly take no credit for, uh, but uh, I need glasses for distance. I don't need glasses to look at my notes here or to recognize people in the first five or 10 rows, but for distance I do, which means I wear glasses about 5% of the day. Uh, I shouldn't be driving without glasses or watching a movie without glasses, but otherwise I, I can get, get, get by without glasses. And the problem was that um, I kept losing and breaking my glasses. Why? Because I hardly ever wore them. They would nestle in the pocket or something. I forget they were there. I'd bang into a wall, they'd break. Or in Kerala, where I go around in my munda, my dhoti, without any pockets, I'd often rest them on my lap when I wasn't using them. When I got up, they'd fall to the ground. Somebody would step on them, they'd crack, or I'd leave them somewhere and forget where I left them, etc. cetera. Uh, it was one year when I had lost or broken six pairs of glasses in three months, and with a prescription that can get to be rather expensive, that I was complaining to a friend, and uh, he said, what's the matter? And I said, look, the reason is very simple. For 150 years, glasses have been made only one way. They sit on the bridge of your nose and they hang over your ears. And I happen to find that uncomfortable, so I don't like wearing them, except when I need them, and then where do I put them? This is where they get lost. He said, you're right, for 150 years, that's the way glasses have been made, but it can be done differently. And I have a solution, he said. And a few months later, he came back with what I'm now wearing around my neck, which is a pair of glasses that doesn't rest on your ears and doesn't rest on the bridge of your nose or hang on your ears, but hangs conveniently around your neck where you can forget they're there until you actually need them and you want to say hello to somebody in the back there, at which point you can click them in place with a pair of magnets, <laughs> say hello, and then unclick them again when you no longer need them. Now, it's a simple example of creative out-of-the-box thinking. That is, there is nothing that we take for granted that cannot be reimagined if we think of it hard enough and originally enough. That's why, of course, inventions occur. That's why new ways of doing old things are happening all the time. But these things are not coming out of India enough because we in India aren't encouraging this out-of-the-box thinking. We are the land of the one correct answer, right? The teacher says, this is the correct answer. This is what I want to see in the exam paper. That is not good enough. You'll never get this with the one correct answer. So, um, you know, we are the country that actually invented the concept of the zero. Today, it seems that all we invent is zero. We really need to think more creatively again. Uh, we are too proud of the fact that since the 1960s, we've produced the world's second largest pool of trained scientists and engineers. But of course, what's interesting is there were more than our own protected economy could absorb. And so uh, their talents outran the facilities and opportunities available, and they have migrated to make their fortunes elsewhere, particularly founding companies in Silicon Valley, inventing the Pentium chip, inventing Hotmail, even winning the Americans a few Nobel Prizes, so that brings me to the fourth E that I'm troubled about, which is that of employability. Factly, when people go away, our lack of, of opportunities here meant that we had the world's largest brain drain. But some would say in some ways that the world's gr the greatest contribution to the world by India in recent years was the export of the educated professional. Um, and to my mind, um, this, this is really not, um, not what we want. What we, what we want, of course, is the, the indispensable practice of creating opportunities in our society for educated, innovative, creative professionals to work. But is our education system doing that? The honest truth is no. Even today, the quality and employability of the vast majority of our graduates is being questioned. Employers' organizations like FICI, CII, ASOCHAM, have conducted studies that have established widespread levels of dissatisfaction with the quality of the graduates available for hire. I've spoken to CEOs who tell me that once you get beyond the top institutions, the graduates they hire from the rest of the year's uh, batch from other universities and colleges actually need remedial education to make up for what they should have learned but haven't learned properly in college or university. If you go to Mysore, you can see the Infosys campus uh, or outside Tiruvannathapuram, the Tata campus. These are 
huge campuses. Infosys looks like an American university. And that's what they do. They spend a year really giving university type courses to the people they've already hired to bring them up to the level required to do their own jobs properly. That, to my mind, is, is, is really a shame because our well-educated graduates are not meeting the needs of our employers. And there's also a skill mismatch between the qualifications we're providing them and the jobs they undertake. A policy that encourages non-graduate technical and non-technical diploma holders into lower intensity occupations would normally help close the skills gap because you put them into places where jobs are available. But now, everybody wants high qualifications whether jobs are available or not. Last year, the Madhya Pradesh Police Department advertised 14,000 posts of constables. Nine lakh candidates applied for these 14,000 jobs. Among them were 10,000 engineering graduates, including a dozen PhD holders, 1,90,000 other graduates, and 15,000 postgraduates. In other words, we're releasing graduates into an economic ecosystem that doesn't know how to use them. For the talent we have, we don't seem to know what to do with it. Some 60% of our engineering graduates today are ending up in jobs that do not require an engineering degree. And I'm not even counting those engineers who get no jobs at all, because there are those also. It's clear that we need to close this quality skill gap in high graduate intensity occupations, uh, engineers, advocates, medical and legal professionals, and so on. We need to identify the actual needs, the demand from these sectors in creating seats in higher education. And you all already at the streaming stage of high school should really respect your children's aptitudes. Yesterday I was addressing the London School of Economics alumni in Delhi, and one young man said that he was starting a new software that children could use to assess their own aptitudes before streaming into science or humanities or commerce or whatever in high school. And I said, all very well for the child to know what his or her aptitude is, but you have to also persuade the parents. Because the biggest problem in our country is that whatever the child may wish to do or be interested in doing, it's the parent who wants a child to fulfill his or her dreams, right? So every middle class Indian parent wants a child to be a doctor or an engineer. And if the child says, I'd rather study history or literature, parents say, yeah, useless, why should you do that? Do what I want you to do. And very often, I'm sorry to say, the school obliges because that's the expectation. I was looking back incredibly lucky in my father, because as I told you, I was very good at taking exams. I came first in everything throughout. But in, when we were streaming at the end of class eight to class nine, uh, the ISC uh, high school period, I opted for humanities. And my teachers were so upset, they summoned my parents to the school and said, this is our best science student. He's come first in science throughout every year, right up to class eight. Why should he go and do humanities? So my parents asked me and I said, I came first because I can take exams. I know what's expected of me in writing an examination but you will, I forget everything I've studied the day after the examination. Science doesn't interest me. Whereas you ask me about history or literature, I can tell you things beyond what I've studied for the examination. And my father fortunately had the liberality and breadth of vision to say, all right, study what you want. Even though he too, like every other middle class Indian parent, would have loved to have had a doctor or an engineer coming out of his family. And this is something that we really have to get right. I meet regularly when I travel around the world IFS officers, Indian Foreign Service diplomats, who are fully qualified doctors or engineers. And I asked them quite rudely, why aren't you practicing medicine? Sir, this is what I want to be. I said, in that case, why did you spend five and a half years studying medicine? Not only did you waste your parents' money and your time, but you deprived somebody else of that seat who might have wanted to be a doctor. And they said, sir, we had to do this for our parents. So I said, your parents want you to be a doctor, why are you in the foreign service? Sir, my parents don't mind because the government job they don't mind me taking, but there's no guarantee I would have got into the service. So I, I decided to uh, study medicine. If I didn't get into the administrative service or the foreign service, I would have been a doctor. And I thought, how many under-motivated doctors are there in our country like that? Because their parents have forced them. So I urge you all as teachers and principals, please let the child follow his or her bliss let them do what they want to do in their studies. Um, now, what are some of the big changes? I think I've already hinted at many of them, and I want to really leave enough time for questions and answers, so I'd rather skip some of the obvious arguments. We need, obviously, to get 
uh, to creating an Indian knowledge society, a society capable both of creating theoretical knowledge as well as um, uh, benefiting from it usefully, um, and a society where the pursuit of learning and innovation uh, should not be constrained either by lack of access, infrastructure, or support. Uh, we need to create a talent for research. And I hope that you already in the high school level will encourage your students to start doing some of their own research. Don't ever let them be confined to the textbooks. You know, my, my family found a notebook that I had written when I was 14 years of, of, of age because I was so fascinated by history that beyond the schoolwork and the homework uh, and the required text, I went to the library and found books on history and wrote my own essays for myself. So these are a notebook full of essays that were not corrected by teachers because they were not required by the teachers. They were just for my own interests and to fulfill my own taste. And I'm proud of the fact that at 14 I did that, but I'm also very conscious that nobody else in his right mind would have done that. Maybe it helped that I was suffering from asthma and so I wasn't out playing cricket the whole time. But still, uh, how can we encourage in children a taste to go off and do their own research? Right now, for example, if you look at the number of researchers in India per million people, we have 164 researchers per one million. China has 863. Brazil has 668. Russia has 3,117. And tiny Singapore has 6,000 per a million people. So what I'm trying to say is we are lacking. We are not letting people do their own discoveries, their own research, come to their own conclusions. Uh, during the last figures I could find, 2013, a total of 43,000 patents were filed in India, but only 22% of those patents filed in India were filed by Indians. So we are really way behind, and women, particularly, oddly enough, are left out with only 14% of the total workforce uh, in research and science being women, and that's bizarre because there's no reason why women shouldn't do it. Today, when as an MP, I'm often invited to convocations or to give out prizes, I often find that the majority of prize winners, sometimes almost all the prize winners that I come across in science and medicine uh, are women. And, and that they are the ones who are, who are the students excelling, making it to the dean's list or the, the vice chancellor's list, coming high ranks to the universities. And in school leading examinations also, they by and large are doing better than boys. So why can't we improve the critical mass of them and get past a figure where 14.27% of our total scientific uh, science and technology workforce, only that much are, are women. Now, I, I do want to stress that, of course, there are resource constraints. We're not spending enough of our GDP on education. Uh, most developed countries spend about six to, um, five, five to six percent. We're spending only 3.7, and uh, that was already not good enough because even though our GDP was growing up at one point, the percentage was often dropping. And this particular government has even cut back on how much they're giving uh, of, 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 of government resources to education. Another thing we're not doing enough of, and I know this is irrelevant to all of you though, is vocational studies. I'm sure that anybody who's doing the ISC examinations has an aptitude for higher studies, but in government schools and other schools, there are a lot of children who are better off being streamed into vocational studies. Now in countries like South Korea or Australia, 25 to 40 percent of all high school students opt for vocational studies. And then after the 12th standard, they're ready for a proper job in a trade, a plumber, a carpenter, a mason, whatever it may be. Um, uh, and, and sometimes um, our country actually experiences a shortage of these skilled professionals because everybody wants a, a white collar uh, job and is looking for a degree that will help them get that. Then there is also the question of bureaucracy and, and our, our, our government regulations. Um, I've told you a lot of stories today, I'll tell you one more, but it's not from the ISC system, it's from the CBSC system. One day when I was minister, a nice white-haired old lady came to see me saying that uh, she was running a CBSC school for tribal children in, um, well I can tell you the place, it's Silent Valley, uh, and, and um, she uh, had wanted CBSC affiliation because these kids were actually doing so well that they were that all the academic requirements and, and results required to qualify for CBSC affiliation. Um, 
and, and all the children were either tribal or below the poverty line children. It was, the school was being run in a, in a, in a village area in, this, in, this, uh, in Silent Valley. So I said, what was the problem? And she said, okay, um, I wrote to CBSC. They said, uh, yes, your results justify CBSC affiliation, but under the rules of the government of India, you need a no objection certificate from the state government, an NOC. So the lady trudged off to the state capital and met the bureaucrat who hands out the no objection certificates. And she said, uh, what do I need to do? And he said, no problem, you pay the fee and you'll get the certificate. And she said, well, what is the fee? And he said, well, the official fee is 17 rupees. Uh, what you have to give me is 35 lakhs. Uh, and she sort of said, I don't spend 35 lakhs in running the school every year. That's 200,000 times the, two lakh times the official fee. So she thought it was cheaper to get into an economy flight and come to Delhi to see me. Uh, and I called the head of the um, administration in the MHRD that runs CBSC, but a very bright bureaucrat there, and I said, why do we have this rule of an NOC? Do you realize that by having this rule, you are simply giving an opportunity to rent-seeking bureaucrat, rent bureaucrats and politicians to make money out of something that ought to be a routine document? Why can't we have an approach that if the school has met certain objective academic yardsticks, that you should go ahead and give the affiliation. Why do you have to give the state government bureaucrat that power? And he said, sir, you're right, we'll do that. He put forward a recommendation to the governing board of the CBSC, but then elections were called, the code of conduct came in, we lost the election, a new government came, and his recommendation was scrapped. So that poor old tribal, that lady still doesn't have her CBSC affiliation. So sometimes our rules are the enemy of actual objectives. We are, we are a country which is far more obsessed with rules and processes than with outcomes. And this I find uh, a, a terrible, terrible uh, distraction. <coughs> Government schools are other problems you don't have. Teacher absenteeism, we have the world record in that. Uh, global shortage of teachers. Um, we have um, uh, serious issues in terms of um, uh, suitability of the curriculum. Uh, rural urban disparities, a lack of uniformity and parity in, in teaching methods. Uh, then, of course, in some parts of the country, conflict ridden districts, areas affected by left wing extremism, and so on. We have the challenge of adequate school penetration. How is it safe for a child to go to school? Who will open a school and staff it and teach there? All of these challenges are, are rather important. And, of course, there is now the new uh, fancy for the use of ICT in education. I don't know how many of you are uh, doing any distance learning in your classrooms by letting children listen in to some fancy teacher somewhere uh, halfway across the country or across the globe. The idea is good, uh, but to my mind, there is no substitute for the actual teacher in the classroom interacting with the children. And um, in any case, whenever we tried this in government schools, we had problems like no electricity during school hours. So how do you actually connect the, the video, uh, video conference? So then we would give them a generator, uh, but then they didn't have money to buy the diesel for the generator. So the uh, video conference didn't work. Or the broadband width was so bad that even after the video conference came through, it would either be so full of static that no one could understand, or it would break down. And then there is also the language appropriateness. You may get a top quality lecturer uh, whose language goes right above the heads of your students. So the teacher has to be somebody who fully appreciates and understands the lecture and can interpret it properly for the students. All of these things, I think, have shown me that in India, we can't just borrow a template from a Western country and say, oh, they have massive online courses, they have video conference courses, they have ICT instruction, let's do that. To my mind, um, uh, we, we um, are really uh, better off ensuring that hands-on, on-the-spot, face-to-face teaching by teachers and students is what we, we really need in our country. So I want to, to wrap this up by, by coming back to the, the purpose of education. We need to create good students, obviously, but we also need to create good citizens, people who have a respect for excellence and accomplishment, people who are able to think creatively, think out of the box, people who are able to deal with the challenges that life will offer them once they leave the schoolyard, and people who can also contribute to fulfilling the Indian dream, being productive, employable, useful members of our society. If we can do that, 
then it seems to me we can avoid the pitfalls and traps that we've all seen from the unemployable kids in the Maoist insurrections to the unemployed engineering graduates who are not able to find work and are applying for jobs of constables. We should be able to do that, provided we lay the foundations at the school level. As the Nobel Prize winning Chilean poet Gabriela Mistral, who was a school teacher herself when she won the Nobel Prize, as she so poignantly said, we are guilty of many crimes, but our worst sin is abandoning the child, neglecting the foundation of life. Many of the things we need can wait. The child cannot wait. We cannot answer tomorrow. Her name is today. So let a thousand educational flowers bloom. Thank you very much. I'll take your questions. Jay. So, do we have mics in the audience if people have questions? Or how does, how's it going to work? Will somebody come and play five questions? So, will you be the traffic policewoman and choose the five questions, please? <laughs> Is there a mic in the audience, or will people come up to the stage? Yes, I'll repeat your question until they find the mics. There seem to be mics there. Yeah, go ahead. No, I think I've already answered that. When I said we don't need well-filled minds, we need well-formed minds. Well-filled mind is a mind that's full of facts, which frankly, many of us who went through the educational system a few decades ago, we are all very good at that. I can quote passages of Shakespeare, I can recognize biblical allusions, I can tell you, uh, I can do, do a lot of mathematics in my head, I can tell you historical dates without looking them up, and so on and so forth. But the irony is that is not a useful skill in the real world today. Those are things that you can very easily find uh, on your mobile phone. Just go on Google and you have your answers. You. What is far more important is what you do with that information. How do you discern patterns in information? How do you take the information and actually come up with an insight that can be useful? That is something we don't inculcate enough in schools. And to my mind, more education that helps children to come up with the answers themselves rather than merely memorizing facts and figures and lines of poetry and so on, is with the direction in which we need to go. Many Western systems have already made that leap. We haven't. Yes. Good morning. Morning. Dr. Tharoor. Um, we have a situation where the whole world and his wife has taken to Twitter or some other form of social media in commenting. And as part of the educator community, how do we teach our children to separate the chaff from the grain and to understand what matters, what opinion matters, and how that particular opinion should be weighed or considered, since people say things and then retract them almost immediately? Excellent question, and actually feeds into yours, sir, the gentleman who asked the question here, because the purpose of a well-formed mind is precisely to be able to make that kind of judgment. If we have taught our children well, they will have the context to judge false claims. There's so much out there on the internet that is frankly dishonest and lying. But people, the ones who are not properly educated, will take these things literally because they've seen them on the internet and they will have no frame of reference to judge that this is a dubious claim that must be analyzed against corroborative evidence, or that this is a, a statement that just doesn't sound right, I must check it, or this is something which flies in the face of things I know to be true, and therefore this must be untrue. That kind of thing can only come through an educated mind. So if you educate children to have a breadth as well as a range of knowledge, then when social media and the internet claim false things or stupid things, they'll immediately pause for a minute and say, now wait a minute, that doesn't fit in with what I've learned, and they'll check. 
One of the great frustrations today in public life for people like me in India is that we are dealing with a whole bunch of people who are often credulous, who are willing to swallow uncritically the most preposterous lies. I mean, let's face it, I don't mean to be offensive politically, but we have a prime minister who made a speech saying that Ganesha's head shows that we practiced plastic surgery and transplantation in the ancient days. Now, the first thing an educated person would do is ask yourself for one minute whether the smallest imaginable elephant head can fit on the largest imaginable human neck. And then, once you have studied enough to know broadly what's feasible and not, you know that such a claim is preposterous, right? Now, the irony of that, however, is that India actually is the world's pioneer in plastic surgery. There are authentic documents going back 2,000 years that Shushruta is known as the father of modern surgery, and rhinoplasty, nasal operations, were performed in the Vedic period. And even some of the instruments used to perform them have survived. So there is no dispute about that. But when you make completely absurd and unrealistic claims like the Ganesh head or the Pushpak Vimans, which are these planes that allegedly flew across ancient India in the, in the ancient times, when you make such claims, you discredit the genuine and real accomplishments of your civilization. So an educated person would be somebody who can tell what is real, what is verifiable, what evidence has been provided to support a particular thing, and the source of that evidence. Because you can also have fake sources. For example, the fellow who presented a paper at the Indian Science Congress claiming there were Pushpak Vimans was actually quoting what he claimed was a Vedic document from the past. But within five minutes on the internet, if you Google, you'll find that that document was created and discredited in the 1920s. Already in the 1920s, it was proved to be a crude forgery and not an authentic Vedic document. And yet, 90 years later, at the Indian Science Congress, no less, somebody is picking up this thing, and this particular Shastra shows they were Pushpak Vimans, which they weren't. So the, the, the reason, I think, I hope that you would all educate children not to take anything literally unless it comes from a totally verifiable source. I suppose the Encyclopedia Britannica or any other, even news sources that are famous for fact checking, that employ armies of fact checkers. That's important. There are also institutions like factcheck.com and their various equivalents, which actually make a point to take any popular claims and, and study them and analyze them. There are also undoubtedly in our country as well, uh, various reputable sources of authentic information. So whenever inauthentic information comes up, teach children how to check. Teach them why certain information should only be believed if it's verified through actual evidence. How do you value evidence? Is evidence real or concocted? These are things that, frankly, our own journalists don't know enough about, and they should. But at least our educated children should be taught, or are we doing a great disservice to our own society? Uh, good morning, sir. May Sorry, I ask you a question? Oh, okay. Sir, you said the... Okay, we'll come to you next, ma'am. I think since you both have mics. Go ahead. Sir, you said one of the biggest dangers we are facing in this country is the educated un unemployed. How do we, as principals, would like to address this problem at three levels? One is the school level. The second is to create employment. The second is at the public sector level. And most of all, the government level. Now, what advice do you have to offer us as a forum where we could be useful? Many of our students get into all the elitist uh, institutions, but we do have a few students who do not match up, and they are unemployed as well. So how do we address this problem for the entire country? So we, this danger of the unemployed is going to be tremendous. I agree completely to what you said, sir. But we have to address the problem all the same. So what is your advice to all three sectors of people there's who no deal easy, with this? There's no easy answer. I mean, one obvious thing to suggest is that we should encourage children from an early age, say class 10 or so onwards, to think already about what they'd like to do in their lives. 
But I'm very conscious that unfortunately, especially in our overprotective culture, a child at that age is probably still not ready to figure out what they want to do in their life. And therefore, uh, there is definitely a danger of somebody genuinely taking the wrong stream because they don't know any better, or simply being directed by their parents because the parents you know, have their own ambitions. Uh, I remember one wonderful cartoon I saw of uh, a, a big elephant telling a baby elephant, you know, my son, I want you to fulfill and do all the things that I couldn't do in my life. For example, I was never able to fly. You will. And this is the kind of thing Indian parents are constantly doing to their children. And the problem is, of course, that that poor baby elephant is going to be under the burden of failing to fulfill his father's dreams all the time. And this is the, the real challenge uh, in, in, in thinking about where the, the, the child goes wrong. Employability is also linked to two kinds of things. One is the level of opportunities in our economy. Right now, the opportunities aren't there. There are very few new jobs being created. Um, despite the government's promises of creating two crore jobs, government figures show the maximum they've created in one year is one lakh jobs. So we are at, uh, at, 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 at half a percent of the desired target, and we're not going to get there. So the government is not taking refuge in saying there should be more self-employment. So perhaps encouraging your children to also think in terms of how they could generate a livelihood for themselves in situations where employment may not be available is also important. Then ultimately, if people have some sense, and some of them will, of what they want to do, then help gear them towards it. Ask them, what do you think you want to do? And if, if somebody feels that his destiny in life is to make a fortune being a cricket star, make sure that he puts in eight hours a day after school practicing cricket or he's never going to get there. Uh, it, it, it depends very much on the aptitude, the talent, the motivation. You know, motivation has to come from within. Not even a teacher can instill it. A teacher can definitely encourage it. I often say that motivation is like love. It has to come from within. The teacher can provide the candlelit uh, romantic atmosphere and, the, and the, uh, you know, the soft music. But the feeling of love has to come from within the individual. And similarly, the feeling of motivation to do something must come from within the individual, but the teacher can help provide the environment in which that motivation is brought out. Sir, one question. Sir. The lady here has a mic earlier. Sorry, I'll come to you next. Sir, you, sp Sir, you spoke about... I'm sorry, your mic isn't working. Somebody will have to fix that mic. Meanwhile, go ahead. Sir, my question is that you already yeah. discussed about the history. Last 20 years, I am teaching social studies. And this year also, I taught 1857 war of first war of independence. Next year, I'm sorry, 1857. 80, 1857, Shipai mutiny. That is called as first war of independence. I'm not hearing you clearly. Sorry. 1857 revolt. That is called as the Indian first war of independence. And next year onwards, I have to teach 18. 17 war is the first war of independence. What I should tell to students is I was teaching wrong or history is rewritten? No, these are labels. I think what you should do is give children the actual concept, the actual facts, and let them determine how they would want to. For example, the war of 1857 was fought across larger chunks of India than any of the earlier uh, or later attempts. And um, the British did try to disparage it by just calling it a mutiny. They called it the Sepoy mutiny as if that was all it was. It was much more than that because people who were not Sepoys, including Maharajas, Maharanis, and so on, rose up against the British in the process. So you could construct a case. You could actually have a discussion in the class saying, these are the reasons why some historians call it a war of independence. Now, these are the reasons why some disagree that it did not engage the whole country, that many Indians fought on the side of the British, whatever it may be, one thing after the other, and therefore some historians argue this is not a war of independence. You discuss and come up with your conclusion, but don't let it be that there is only one right answer. If the child is able to give you good reasons for either answer, you should give the child the intellectual respect as long as he's been able to structure his response. That would be my answer, because ultimately the label doesn't matter. People who were fighting at that time didn't call it anything. They were fighting. You know, Rani Lakshmi was fighting for her kingdom. Somebody else was fighting not to use certain kinds of uh, bullets which had pork or beef uh, 
Greece uh, on them. Somebody else was fighting to restore the Mughal monarch. There were a number <coughs> of motivations, but people came up wanting to overthrow the hated foreign oppressor. So give the children as much range of information as possible, facts, and then let them construct their own argument. I mean, by the time you get to about class 10, it seems to me you should be able to construct an argument on, uh, in response to a question like 1857, was the first war of independence to discuss whether it was or was not. And you can take either side. Your child should not feel that if he gives one answer, he will get zero, and if he gives another answer, he'll get 10. He may to feel that the other answer is badly argued, he will not get 10. And if the first answer is well argued, he'll get 10. You see what I'm saying? There's got to be much more about the kind of mind that is applied to finding an answer than the mere label itself. Yes. So you spoke about demographic disaster. And I would like to mention here about demographic transition that we face as school principals every day. Uh, we have single child in the family with either a single parent with grandparents or a single child with four to five uh, elderly people. This makes a child very, very fragile because of the overprotective people all around. So, sir, how do we make them resilient? Because it's becoming very, very difficult for us. You know, this is a genuine problem to which, again, there is no real answer because it's an emotional issue. You know, frankly, one of the reasons people used to have large families is because there was no guarantee of the survival of the children. So if you had eight or nine children, you'd be happy if five or six survived to look after you in your old age. That was the old custom. Now, by and large, thanks to modern healthcare and so on, the child survives. Secondly, you know, most people aren't sending their child off to uh, weave carpets or, or, or work in the fields. They are going to school. If you send a child to school, the child becomes an economic liability, not an asset. Therefore, you think hard about how many children you want to have, whether you can afford to educate them, whether you can afford to clothe them, feed them properly, and so on. You end up with one child or two, and you said very often single children, then that child obviously is completely cosseted because that's the only child. You certainly can't afford anything to happen to that child, and so you are massively overprotective. On top of that, we have a media culture in which sensationalism is all around us. So every parent who watches the evening news is terrified that, you know, the child's throat is going to be slit or the child is going to be kidnapped or the child is going to be molested or whatever. And so the protectiveness is that much greater because we're so much more conscious of the dangers. It's not that I think the dangers are necessarily any more than they used to be when I was a kid. But when I was a kid, no one knew there were all these dangers around. The media wasn't talking about it. The media was boringly reporting minister's speeches. Today, the media is full of sensationalism. And so parents tend to worry. All of these things, I think, become a factor. And it's very difficult to tell a parent, don't be overprotective. But what you could do is to suggest to a parent um, that within the limits of the protections that you want, please encourage the child to be adventurous in a thoughtful way. Because ultimately, one day, that child is going to need the ability to stand on his own feet. A certain amount of counseling of parents is also, I think, necessary. You can never instill independence in a child alone, because the child has a context that dictates the extent to which he or she is able to be independent. And I would myself um, uh, uh, feel that, that it's only uh, those parents who have the courage to let go a little bit, to, to, to grant the, the child a bit of uh, freedom, to allow some amount of risk taking, who, who will be able to. And there, the teachers have to encourage the parents in a constructive way. Uh, that doesn't mean that the child should be allowed to do foolish things. So some boundaries always have to be, have to be drawn, because the child must also get the, the, the discernment and the judgment. I mean, a very good friend of mine uh, believes very much in a philosophy. She's a widow. So her child is a young boy, uh, her only child. She gives him a lot of freedom because she doesn't want him to be too cosseted. She sent him to a boarding school so he wouldn't be at home with the grandparents and her all the time, etc. But when this chap decided to climb the school gate and slipped, and the spikes on top of the gate pierced his belly and he had to go to the hospital, at that point, he said, this child also needs to be taught which risks are worth taking. Climbing to the top of a school gate with spikes on top is not smart for an 11-year-old. And he should know he shouldn't do that. But at the same time, uh, there are other things that, indeed, she's wise to encourage him to do, to go on school mountaineering treks, to uh, well, supervised by a teacher, or to go out, uh, try out for a school team in a sport which 
and the team goes out to other cities and other countries and plays. And so he discovers a greater sense of his own individual capacity. So discernment and judgment is also important, but freedom is indispensable. Thank you, sir. Sir, just one last question. I request you, please. Just one last question. And then the very last question. Yes, the very last question. <laughs> yes. Uh, my question is an expansion of classroom learning, which is distilled from my observations in daily life. I believe we are excellent at classroom learning and teaching. What we fail it as what you said, life, uh, the exam called life. We, we very nicely teach the child right from prep, red light means stop and green light means go. But when the child sits in the car, when the parent comes to pick up the child, the very child who's learned this rhyme sees the father skip the red light. And the balance, the, the dichotomy the child grows up with, he understands this is only for learning in the classroom and getting good marks on the mark sheet. And in real life, we can do something else, break rules. Very we, good observation. We need to uh, fill this gap through our education system. So one of the things we need, sorry, is it on the same question? No, not the same question. Let me just answer this question. Uh, uh, because the question is a very important one because it goes to the heart of our culture as well. We have to also teach children that sometimes people, including people they love, will do the wrong thing, but that doesn't make it right. One of the very interesting successes of Indian social engineering has been the anti-tobacco education in schools. Because what is happening is the child who is taught about the dangers of tobacco is going home and throwing away the parent's cigarettes. This, I've heard this from so many children, and statistically measurably, the percentage of smokers in India has dropped after we started teaching the dangers of tobacco in our school system. So you can tell children, you know, tobacco is bad, it gives you lung cancer, it gives you throat, this thing, it gives you respiratory problems, all of this. Unfortunately, some people feel it gives them pleasure and they put the pleasure above their health. So you must understand that there is pleasure, but there is also this great damage. And some people wrongly make the judgment that this pleasure is worth more than this damage. You as a young person have to think for yourself. First of all, this means that if that child ever meets somebody who tries to get him to smoke, he will be making this moral calculation. Do I want the damage? Is this experience worth this pain? That already is a good thing you've accomplished. But equally, when the child goes home and sees the father smoking, the child may say, my father's made the wrong calculation. And very often, children think they have all the answers anyway. So he's going to say, I am right and dad is wrong, so I'll throw away his cigarettes. And when this happens a few times, it's very difficult for the father to say, you can't throw away my cigarettes. Because the father shamefacedly has to accept that what the child has been taught in school, which, that this is wrong, is wrong. So for example, in your, in your case, in the, your story, if the child then says to the father, daddy, you ran a red light. We've been taught in school that's wrong. The father has to find some explanation if he treats his child with respect. If he just says, shut up, I know what I'm doing, unfortunately, he will lose the respect of his child. But if he says, look, you know, I know the rules, but there was no other car about, we were in a hurry, we were late for your mother's appointment, whatever it may be, so I had to rush, the child then starts making these calculations in his head. He just doesn't take it to that extreme level of saying, oh, this is only for learning in school and real life or something else. He says, okay, this is the right thing I've been taught in school, but my father has found grounds for an exception. Maybe I agree with my father, this time we should make an exception, but tomorrow if he doesn't have such a good reason, I'll stop him. So that's how we socialize children into adhering into the good behaviors that our society needs. That's how we produce good citizens. Thank you all very much. Sir, so, excuse me. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, request you that from your level, if we could spread the sense of vocational training and hands-on skills in the, uh, in the edu education system in the school level, that's one thing. And uh, develop the sense of nationalism in the children by giving two years of civic service uh, to their state. And the third thing is, you know, the dignity of labor. Like, for example, in Japan, there's no concept of janitors in the, in the schools. And the children, they clean their schools before departure. These are the very small things that we, our country should really uh, think about and bring a change in. 
Would you please, uh, please spread this ideas. awareness? As you know, I'm in no position of authority now, but I'm very happy to, to consider these ideas. Any of you who has, didn't have a chance to speak and wants to send me an email with some ideas can write to office at tharoor.in, T-H-A-R-O-R dot I-N, and I'll be very happy to consider and respond to, to these ideas. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for that captivating address. Indeed, intelligence will never stop being beautiful. Can we have a huge round of applause for sir once again? As I request, our father, George Matthew Karur, Regional Secretary, to offer a memento to our guests. Thank you so much.